This lecture will cover the bones, muscles, and nerves of the upper limb, also known as the arm. Let us start our discussion of the arm by focusing on the bones. Now, the bones attach the bones of the arm attach to the axial skeleton in one single place, uh, and that one place is, as we can see up here in the left, um, where the clavicle or your collarbone articulates with the manubrium of your sternum. And so here we can see the sternum, and of course we have this articulation or joint uh, with the clavicle. So that is the one single point where your entire arm is going to directly articulate with the axial skeleton. Okay, of course your arm and your shoulder is held in place with muscles and connective tissue and whatnot, but um, this is the one joint with your axial skeleton. Okay, so um, the clavicle and the scapulae um, or your shoulder blades make up what is called the pectoral girdle. And so this is similar to what we saw um, in the pelvis. The pelvic girdle um, consists of your hip bones attaching to your sacrum. The pectoral girdle is in your pectoral region or in um, the breast region, essentially. Um, and this consists of, again, this kind of ring of bone tissue around the axial skeleton, again, consisting of the clavicle and the scapula. Now you are uh, responsible for knowing the clavicle. Um, there are only two structures on the clavicle that you should be familiar with, and that is the sternal end, so the medial side, and the acromial end. And so um, note that the clavicle is somewhat S-shaped, um, but one half of the S is really deep, the other half is not. And so this deep half of the S essentially follows the, um, the curve of your rib cage, and so it is much larger, and therefore um, it is the medial side. So this shows us the sternal end, and the acromial end is actually what articulates with what is called the acromion of the scapula bone. And so now let's move to the right. Um, this image up to the right top corner shows you the right scapula from the front and the back. And so this smooth part right here is actually uh, right up against your rib cage, more or less. Um, so nice and smooth so that when you shrug your shoulders, you don't have uh, your scapula kind of like hitting your ribs. Um, and so that's the anterior side. The posterior side is this half of the model right here. And note that on the posterior side, there is a big ridge of bone, again, that we don't want to hit our rib cage every time we shrug our shoulders. Okay, so that is the spine of the scapula. Note that the spine extends a little bit beyond the main portion of the bone. And this um, projection or this process is called the acromion. And so this is where the acromial end of the clavicle gets its name. Okay. Um, projecting anteriorly, is a smaller process called the coracoid process. And I emphasize C-O-R-A-C-oid process because we are going to see today in this lecture um, the coronoid process. It's okay, so very important to keep those two straight. Um, all right, if we look at the lateral view, so here we are looking from the side of the body. The arm has been removed. The rest of the body has been removed. Um, this direction is anterior. This direction is posterior. And I point this out because um, the spine of the scapula right here, as well as the scapula itself, the main body of the scapula, forms essentially three what are called fossae, um, or fossa for singular. Um, there is one kind of little cup or indentation of the bone up here, and that is called the supraspinous fossa, so above the spine indentation. Down here, right, forming, formed by this kind of C shape of bone, that is the infraspinous fossa, so underneath the spine of the scapula. Um, and finally, the subscapular fossa, so essentially underneath the scapula, in between the shoulder blade and the rib cage. And so these are not terms that you need to know um, and be able to reproduce for me, but they're going to be very important because as we'll see in this lecture, there is a muscle in the supraspinous process, a muscle in the infraspinous process, fossa that is, um, and in the subscapular fossa. And so um, 
all of these muscles are named accordingly and it's really important for you guys to know um, which side of the bone the muscles are found on. Okay. Um, there is one more structure on the scapula that you are required to know and that is this surface right here. Right, we can also see um, when we look at the bone laterally that there is this big cup off to the side. Um, that cup happens to be where the humerus, right, or your upper arm bone, is going to articulate. So that forms part of your shoulder joint, and that is called the glenoid cavity. So now we're going to move down the arm. The next bone is the humerus. Um, and so you might have heard this bone called the funny bone. Of course, uh, humerus indicates that it is funny in some way. Um, however, I want to point out that humerus, the adjective that is so humerus, so funny, um, is not how this bone is spelled. Note that there is no O in humerus. Right? This is a Latin word, and so the ending is simply U-S, or U-S, sorry, um, not O-U-S. Right? Very important there. Okay, so just like we've done with the leg, with other bones, um, both of these images are showing you a right humerus. Okay, um, on this side we see the anterior or the front, and on this side we see the posterior. Okay, so let's start proximally and work our way distal. Um, the head of the humerus is what articulates with the uh, glenoid cavity of the scapula, so this forms part of your uh, shoulder joint. Okay. As always, the head is on top of the neck, and so this skinny portion right here, right next to the articular cartilage covered head, is called the anatomical neck. And so if we have to specify anatomical neck, there's probably going to be some other kind of neck, and that is absolutely the case. Um, this entire structure up here is the epiphysis, okay, so the wider um, joint part of the bone. Um, and then, of course, this entire structure here is the diaphysis. And so, uh, where the epiphysis starts to narrow down to the diaphysis, we see another kind of neck. Now, this, um, by anatomical definition, is not the neck, but it is clinically significant in that um, a lot of times if you're going to break your shoulder, or break the humerus part of your shoulder, you're probably going to break it right around in here, right, right where the bone starts to narrow down into the diaphysis. And um, as a result, a lot of surgery has to happen right around in here to reconstruct your shoulder. And so we call this narrowing down uh, from epiphysis into diaphysis the surgical neck. A okay. um, couple more structures within the epiphysis itself. Um, on the lateral side of the proximal humerus, we have this fairly large rougher projection. This is called the greater tubercle, and this is also for a lot of muscle attachment and whatnot. Um, on the anterior side, we also have another smaller bump. Right? We can't see this on the back, right? nothing over here. It's only on the anterior side, and this is called the lesser tubercle. And if we look in between the two tubercles, we see that there is a groove. Okay, so a little indentation. This happens to be where a couple tendons reside. Um, this is called the intertubercular sulcus. And so a sulcus is a word for a groove. Inter meaning between. And what is it between? It's between the two tubercles. Okay, moving down, we have on the lateral side of the bone, so here on the right lateral side and again on the right lateral side on this side, um, is a rough projection. Um, this is also for muscle attachment. Specifically, this is for the attachment of your deltoid muscle or the muscle that gives you that curve of your shoulder. Um, so this is called the deltoid tuberosity. All right, and zooming all the way down to the bottom of the screen, we see the distal epiphysis. Lots of different things going on here because there's not only one joint articulating with the humerus, but there are two joints articulating with the humerus. Okay, On the lateral side, we have the articulation with the radius. Okay, so the radius is going to come off right here. Um, on the medial side, we have articulation with the ulna. Okay, So two different joints um, 
One joint can produce flexion and extension, and that's it. The other joint can flex, extend, pronate, and supinate. So lots of different types of movements um, are, have, are capable within this radio humerus joint. Okay. Um, so we have two different articular surfaces. All right. First of all, the articular surface um, that joins with the radius is this almost marble shape right here. So very spherical um, is the capitulum. Um, and we also have the trochlea. Now trochlea is a word that means hourglass. Okay, and so if you use your imagination, this structure, which we can see from the anterior side as well as the posterior side, looks roughly like an hourglass, and therefore we call this uh, the trochlea. Okay, now any smooth articular surface is um, in general called a condyle. Now these um, two condyles are very specific, so they have very special names. However, we can call the bumps on top of these smooth articular surfaces epicondyles, just like we did um, with the femur. Okay, so on the medial side, right, or on um, the pinky side, um, is the medial epicondyle, epi on top of condyle, smooth articular surface. We can see this over here as well as on the back. Okay, and finally, we have the lateral epicondyle, again, a bump for muscle attachment um, on the capitulum. All right, note that the medial epicondyle can be seen from the front, and so that's going to become important in muscles that are on the front of your forearm. And the lateral epicondyle really can only be seen from the back, and so the lateral epicondyle is going to become important for the muscles on the back of your forearm. Okay, um, now we have the right radius and the right ulna. Right. The ulna is always on the medial side of your forearm. So this, um, this bone is on the pinky side of your forearm, whereas the radius is on the thumb side of your forearm. The ulna conveniently has a little U on the proximal end. Right? So there's going to be one process here and there's going to be another process here. Okay, so you, if you look at this bone from the side, it literally looks like a U. Therefore, this is the ulna. Again, the ulna is always on the pinky side. Okay. Um, the most proximal process or extension of bone is called the olecranon or olecranon process. Okay. And um, if you actually look at the back of the humerus, you'll see a really big indentation on the back of the distal side. This is called the olecranon or olecranon fossa for indentation. Okay, uh, next process is called, again, the core o noid process. All right, core a coid is part of the scapula, core o noid is part of the ulna. Okay, and so this um, projects up right here. Okay, um, once again, if you look at uh, the front, the anterior distal portion of the humerus, you can actually see a little indentation called the coronoid fossa. All right, and that's actually referred to on the previous slide, so definitely take a look. Um, coronoid process fits into the coronoid fossa. Olecranon process fits into the olecranon fossa of the humerus. Okay. Um, finally, in between these two processes, we have the trochlear notch. And as you might imagine, the trochlear notch is going to articulate with or form a joint with the trochlea on the humerus. And so it's this big notch, the space in between the two processes here. And so to remember the order of these, um, think O, T, C over the counter. Right, over the counter medicine, OTC, starting with the pointy part of your elbow, which is this right here, the olecranon process, um, and then moving distally to the coronoid process. As we have distally, let's go all the way to the distal portion of the ulna at this point. Um, note the head is way down next to the wrist. Right? And you actually have um, a little projection right here called the styloid process. And so if you use your imagination, 
you can kind of visualize um, a little stiletto heel right here. Right? So stylish stilettos, this is the styloid process. Um, you can actually feel this through your skin. Um, so if you run your fingers along the pinky side of your forearm bone, um, right before you get to um, the back of your hand, you'll feel this little bone kind of sticking out to the back. That is your styloid process. Okay, uh, the radius. Right. Your radius um, has a lot more mobility than your ulna does. Right? Um, you can cross your thumb over your pinkies and back again, so pronate versus supinate, as well as bend your arm at the elbow, uh, so flexion and extension. And so all of that movement um, is possible in the radius only, not in the ulna, because of this head. Right, so when you look at this head, um, you can see how it's nice and round. It fits perfectly over the capitulum, and this allows for a lot of um, various movements at this joint. Okay, once again, if we look all the way down to um, the distal end of the radius, we see a less prominent but still very important little point. This is also called the styloid process. Right. And finally, we get to the hand. Now, this happens to be um, a left hand. Right? All the images are a left hand that we can see on the screen right now. Um, the colorful image is showing you the palm side, so the anterior side, which is the same as this right here. Um, this image is showing you the posterior side. So this is the hand flipped around, so we're seeing the back of the hand. Um, now let's talk about um, kind of the easier bones first. Uh, just like with the foot, we have three different types of phalanges or phalanx for singular. Um, the distal um, are pretty much right under your fingernails. Um, then we have intermediate, and then we have proximal phalanges, right? So they form um, essentially your knuckles, right? So where your palm bones or metacarpals join with your fingers. Okay. Uh, note also that just like in the foot, there's only a distal and a proximal phalanx, um, not an intermediate phalanx within the thumb. Okay. Um, moving proximally, the metacarpals are named the same way the metatarsals are. So this is one two, three, four, and five is at the pinky. Okay, so same exact thing. Um, finally, just like in the, uh, in the tarsal bones, each individual carpal has its own name. Um, and this is a little bit tricky, and that's why I have this um, little animated uh, wrist off to the side here. Um, I want to show you that from the posterior side like this down here you can't see all of the bones right in fact in the bottom right image the posterior side of the left hand um, the one bone the one carpal bone is highlighted in red the same carpal bone that is highlighted um, in the animated wrist off to the left side um, and so um, depending on which perspective you're looking at um, is going to determine whether or not you see seven carpal bones or eight carpal bones. Um, so on the next slide here, we are going to um, walk through the eight carpal bones. Um, I am going to introduce them in two rows. So starting with number one here, and moving across two, three, and four. The fourth one is the highlighted red one that is um, being rotated around. And back to the thumb, five, six, seven, and eight. And I'll show you this more on the other side. Um, one final note, however, on, on, on this slide, this red up here is showing you this bone right here. Okay, let's go to the next slide. All right, so um, we've already talked about the phalanges and the metacarpals, and so um, the bottom left image shows you just the carpals and metacarpals, right? So no fingers on the bottom there. Okay. Um, all right, so as I said, let us walk through these different bones. Um, one, two, 
three and four. Okay, so this is the first row of four. Always start at the thumb side and work your way to the pinky side, whether you're looking at the front or the back of the hand, doesn't matter. Thumb to pinky on the proximal end and then move into the distal thumb to pinky. All right, again, there are eight of them. Okay, so um, you have the names for you right next, uh, right next to this image, but number one is scaphoid, number two is lunate, number three is triquetrum, number four is pisiform. Okay, um, this pisiform bone is the one that's a little bit tricky that you can only really see on the front of your palm. And so I want to also point out that you can feel this through your skin. So if you run your fingers along the bottom of your palm, right about here, you'll feel a little bone. That is your piece of four. Okay, um, so going back uh, to the thumb side, distal row, um, number five here is the trapezium. Note that the tra trapezium is at the base of the thumb. Six is trapezoid. Seven, capitate. Eight is hamate, and so I also gave you guys this little uh, device over here using the first letters of each of the carpal names. So some lovers try for triquetrum positions that they can't handle trapezium at the base of the thumb for the two T's. And finally, we are able to talk about the muscles. Okay, so um, the next several images are going to uh, show you muscles of different layers of um, of the chest, the back, and the arms. Uh, now keep in mind we have lots of different layers and so um, a lot of times uh, there will be muscles that are cut and removed so that we can see whatever is deep to them. So I will try to be as clear as possible about when that occurs. Um, also, uh, these muscles are broken down according to what they move and there are actually four different things that are being moved here. Um, unlike the three different joints or the three different areas within the leg. Here we have the pectoral girdle. So this is literally um, moving your scapulae around, right? So moving your shoulders, allowing you to shrug your shoulders, to pull them down, to protract or retract your shoulders. Um, we're also going to be looking at the shoulder joint itself, right? So the humerus and scapula together. So moving your arm, we're going to talk about our elbow and we're going to talk about our wrist. Okay, now as we're walking through these, you should be following along also and taking notes on um, the origins, insertions, and actions of these different muscles. The first muscle that we will talk about is the pectoralis minor. Now you've probably heard of the pectoralis major. This happens to be just deep to the pectoralis major. Okay, so this here is the pectoralis major. It has been cut and push to the side so that we can actually see the pectoralis minor. Uh, note that the more stable attachment site, right, the origin, is actually on the ribs. Right? And the insertion is on the coracoid process. What this does is it pulls insertion down towards origin. So it's going to depress your shoulders. It's going to pull them down and slouch them forward. So depression and protraction, pushing your shoulders forward, curling up into a little fetal position with your shoulders. The next muscle is the serratus anterior. All right, so it's somewhat on the front end. It is serrated. And so this muscle, um, we'll actually see this in a couple different ways, but the origin is also on the ribs. It's a little bit more lateral as well as um, extends more inferiorly to the pectoralis minor. All right, so what this muscle does is it actually wraps around the rib cage deep to the scapula, deep to your uh, shoulder blade and inserts on the medial edge of your scapula. All right, so what this actually does is it's going to rotate the scapula, right? So this inferior point of the scapula, it's going to rotate it up. And so that's important because in order to raise your humerus um, above your acromion, right? So 
if you want to raise your arms more than here, right, to keep going up, you need to actually spin your scapula. You need to rotate it laterally so that the glenoid cavity, right, so this right here, the glenoid cavity can point up. And so if you were trying to say field goal, right, your hands directly over your head, mountain pose, whatever you do, hands above your head is um, you would need the serratus anterior to literally rotate those scapulae. Um, next, we have the levator scapulae. Um, think about an elevator, right? Um, that raises the box up, it raises you up, and so too does this raise up the scapula, right? Scapulae is for plural. And right, so the origin is on the back of the skull. The insertion is down here on the superior portion of your shoulder blade or your scapula. And so when insertion is pulled towards origin, you shrug your shoulders, right? You elevate the scapula, you're shrugging your shoulders. All right, the next muscle we're gonna see a lot more clearly on the posterior side of the body. Um, but I do want to point out that this big back muscle here, um, actually controls your shoulder, right? so moves your scapula around, um, and it wraps around so that part of um, the insertion is on your clavicle. Okay, so here we can see that trapezius muscle a lot better. Um, I do want to point out that we know a couple of these muscles already. Um, first of all, the serratus anterior, we can see passing around from the front underneath the scapula bone or your shoulder blade. Um, here's the levator scapulae, right? It elevates your scapula, it shrugs your shoulders. Um, and here is the trapezius. And so the trapezius has a huge origin, right? The back of the skull and down cervical and thoracic vertebrae, right? So huge. Um, the insertion is much smaller, and that is on, of course, the clavicle that we saw on the other side, as well as the spine of the scapula. And so this muscle is called the trapezius because um, it looks roughly like a trapezoid. All right, so remember, a trapezoid has a short side, it has a lar large or longer side, and there are two diagonals to, excuse me, to complete this shape. Okay, so um, here, the, ins the insertion is the short end, the origin is the long end, and when insertion is pulled to origin, there are kind of three different things that can happen with the trapezius. Um, we can specifically contract this upper portion, right, and that's going to help you shrug your shoulders. All right, we can contract this lower portion right here, which is going to help you pull your shoulders down Right, so to depress your shoulders. Also, um, we can specifically contract this portion of the muscle. And so that is going to help us to pull our shoulders back, to stand up tall, um, to stand at attention even. Okay, um, so the trapezius has a lot of different actions because it is so big and we can specifically contract one portion or another portion. Okay, moving down. Um, if we remove the trapezius, all right, so on the left, we can see the trapezius intact. On the right, we can see the trapezius is gone. Okay, and so if we look underneath the trapezius, we can see the levator scapulae, but we can also see two rhomboid muscles. Okay, they're called the rhomboids um, commonly, but um, more accurately, the inferior muscle is called the rhomboidius major. So rhomboidius major is the inferior muscle. The origin is again on the spine. And the insertion is here on the inferior medial edge of the scapula. And so when insertion is pulled towards origin, what we see is that the shoulder blades are pulled closer to the spine. So just like the portion of the trapezius, here we have a muscle that is helping us to pull our shoulders back. Right, to stand up straight at attention. Okay. Finally, we have the rhomboidius minor. Okay, this one is a smaller, more superior muscle right here, origin on the spine, insertion on a more superior portion of the medial edge of the scapula. And this has the same action. It's gonna pull your shoulders back. 
All right, now we're looking at the front of the body once again, um, and we've kind of moved uh, moved laterally. All right, so before we were talking about um, moving the shoulders themselves or moving the pectoral girdle, um, now we're talking about moving the arm itself. Um, before we get into specific muscles, I do want to point out that um, in a lot of these slides, I give you instructions on how to get to some videos on mastering AMP. So if you go to your study area, uh, Practice Anatomy Lab has lots of awesome animations. Yes, animations. Um, the ones that are relevant to these particular muscles are the shoulder and the humerus ones. So these are the ones that I think are the best. Um, I highly recommend uh, taking a look at these. They, you know, pretty much eliminate all of the other muscles and show you here's the origin, here's the insertion, here's the action, and let's um, see how it moves. Right. So um, definitely a beneficial supplement to just looking at these diagrams. Okay, so again, we are moving the humerus at this point. We're moving at the shoulder joint. Uh, the first muscle that we're going to look at is the deltoid. Um, and we can't see the entire deltoid here um, because it actually wraps around to the back, and we'll see that here in a moment. Uh, but part of the origin is on the clavicle, the acromion, and the spine of the scapula. It's a pretty big origin. The entire muscle converges down to insert, conveniently enough, on the deltoid tuberosity of the humerus. So if you remember the humerus, there's this really rough bump on the lateral side of the diaphysis. That is where the deltoid attaches. And so there are also a lot of different movements of the deltoid because, again, we can selectively contract different bundles within the deltoid. All right, so if we contract this part of the muscle, this is going to flex our arm at the shoulder. So pretty much um, extending your arm out in front of you to shake somebody's hand. That is extend, or sorry, that is flexion at the shoulder. Okay. If we contract just the lateral fibers of the deltoid, that is going to swing our arm up and out. All right. So that is going to be um, abduction. Right, so both flexion and abduction, and we'll see in just a moment, um, extension as well. All right, next we have the pectoralis major. Uh, the pectoralis major, again, has a pretty big origin, so the clavicle, and here we can see on the sternum, the entire muscle converges down to ultimately insert on the greater tubercle of the humerus. So when insertion is pulled towards origin, this is going to allow us to flex our arm of the shoulder. So again, um, putting your arm out in front of you to shake someone's hand. Um, also adduction, right? So pretty much the opposite of the deltoid. If our arm was out to the side, like we were saying, safe in baseball, the pectoralis major would help us to pull our arms back down next to us. Um, and finally, medial rotation is completed by pectoralis major. And so pretty much if you were to um, take your arms or take your hands and put them on your hips, your shoulders have to rotate um, in order to allow your hands to touch your body. And so the pectoralis major rotates your arm at the shoulder so you can put your hands on your hips. The next muscle we see is the subscapularis. And so I want to point out that on the left rib cage, so not your left looking at this, but the person's left, um, a lot of the rib cage has been removed so that we can see the anterior side of the scapula. Right, so the subscapular fossa is actually filled with the subscapularis muscle. Okay, the origin is on the scapula itself. That happens to be the more stable attachment site because the less stable attachment site is your arm. All right, so here is the lesser tubercle of your, uh, of your humerus. And the subscapularis actually pulls um, the humerus in this direction. So it's literally going to rotate the humerus, um, specifically medial rotation. Um, again, putting your hands on your hips. All right, next we have the coracobrachialis. Um, 
Muscle names like this are super intimidating because they're just so long. However, it's really um, easy, in fact, a lot easier than you might think, because they all follow kind of the same formula. Corico brachialis. So here we have a compound word. The first word is corico. That is, the origin of this muscle is on the coracoid process of the scapula. Brachialis is the insertion, and so this muscle is going to insert on the humerus or on the brachial region, which is behind the biceps here. Um, but again, the origin is always the first half of the compound word, so coracoid process, and the second half of the compound word is um, the insertion of this compound word describing the muscle. And so what exactly does this do? Well, this helps to adduct. All right, so again, pulling from the medial side of the bone, this is going to help to pull the arms closer to the body, um, as well as a little bit of flexion. So putting your hand out in front of you to shake someone's hand. Final muscle we can see just a tiny bit here, but we're going to see on a lot more detail on the other side, um, is teres major. Now, teres major. Um, is a muscle on the posterior side of the scapula, but it actually passes up through the armpit to ultimately insert on the intertubercular groove or intertubercular sulcus. Um, this muscle is responsible for extension, so actually pulling the arm back behind you. Um, like if you were getting ready to um, throw a bowling ball, you would lift the bowling ball behind you and then throw it quickly in front of you. So that pulling the bowling up, ball up behind you is extension. Um, also responsible for adduction and medial rotation. Okay, looking at the back, we've seen some of these muscles before um, and we're seeing some of them for the first time. Um, first muscle that is new is the supraspinatus. Right, I want to point out that this is the spine of the scapula, so on the posterior side. Remember, we looked at um, the scapula having one fossa up here above, the supraspinous fossa, one below the spine, and that was the infraspinous process, okay? And so, or fossa, sorry. Um, the supraspinatus is above the spine. And we can see this from both perspectives in the left and the right shoulder. Um, the supraspinatus um, shares a, um, an insertion point with the infraspinatus, and that is going to be on the greater tubercle. Okay, so this lateral bump on the proximal epiphysis of the humerus. Okay. Supraspinatus is responsible for abduction, and so if it's pulling on the top of the humerus like this, and it's pulling it back closer to the spine here, what that's going to do is it's going to swing the arm up and out. This is abduction. So essentially, if you were saying safe, like baseball safe, um, you would be using your supraspinatus. Uh, the infraspinatus, right, this muscle again is inferior to the spine of the scapula. Um, it shares an insertion with the supraspinatus, um, but because of the different angle of this muscle, um, it's going to be pulling the humerus kind of in this direction. And so it's going to be responsible for lateral rotation, right? So it's not pulling the top over, it is pulling the side back. And so that is responsible for lateral rotation. So you can think about lateral rotation as if, um, you know, for example, you are carrying a tray of drinks if you're a waitress, um, you would rotate your arm out to the side, right, to ha carry that particular tray. Next muscle we have here is the latissimus dorsi. All right, again, kind of a big, scary word, but um, it tells us exactly where it is, what it looks like. Um, so latissimus, um, isimus in Latin means like the most, and so this is the most lateral or the widest of all of the muscles. Um, dorsi, where is this the widest muscle? On the back or on the dorsal region. And so here is the huge origin, right? thoracic and lumbar vertebrae. And the entire thing is going to converge, passing through your armpit right? to actually insert on the front 
of your humerus. Um, it's going to insert in the intertubercular uh, groove or intertubercular sulcus of the humerus. Um, therefore, when insertion is pulled towards origin, towards the back, this is the prime mover of um, shoulder extension. All right, so a lot of times people call this the swimmer's muscle. Um, if you are freestyling, um, you are pulling your arm back and back and back and back, and that is shoulder extension. Um, it's also sometimes nicknamed uh, the butt scratcher muscle, right, for whatever work, um, whatever you think. But anyway, um, extension, um, swimming or pulling a bowling ball back before you throw it. Okay, so that is the latissimus dorsi. Um, we can also see um, another muscle up here in the shoulder, and that is the teres minor. Right? Before we saw the teres major on the front of the arm coming from the back, here we have the teres minor. It is going to insert again on that greater tubercle, and it passes laterally. It passes to the back of the shoulder, um, and so this is responsible for lateral rotation. And again, so putting your arm out to the side with a tray of drinks, as opposed to putting your hands on your hips. All right, final muscle is the teres major. Now note that we have a lot of minor major pairs. Minor is generally um, generally more medial and superior teres, or any of the majors are generally um, both larger as well as inferior. Okay, and the final muscle here is the triceps brachii. Now this happens to be a muscle that crosses not one joint, but two joints. And so it's going to act on both the shoulder as well as the elbow. Its shoulder actions are relatively minor um, compared to its elbow actions, but I'll show it to you here. Um, and then we'll look at it again at the elbow. All right, so the origin is on the shoulder, right? It's crossing over the shoulder joint and um, another head here we can see on the humerus itself. Um, and so the word triceps actually means three seps or heads. Um, and so there are actually three different attachment sites, one of which on the scapula. Okay. Um, and so the insertion is on the olecranon or olecranon process down here. So the pointy part of your elbow, right? You put your elbows on the table. Um, that bone is the olecranon process of the um, of the ulna. Okay, so that's the triceps brachii. Um, this is responsible for um, extension at the shoulder. All right, so pulling your arm back with a bowling ball, um, and it is the prime mover of elbow extension. Right, so if you are swinging a hammer, right? If you are throwing a baseball, if you are any kind of straightening the arm at the elbow. That is your triceps brachii. It is the muscle responsible for that action. All right, so before we move on to uh, talking about the forearm muscles, um, I do want to point out that this is our model from the lab. Um, and I just want to um, point at things and talk about them um, so you have a little bit better of an understanding. All right, so um, on the right half of the back, uh, we can see the more superficial muscles here is your trapezius, your deltoid, your triceps brachii. This is your latissimus dorsi. All right. On the left side of the back, the more superficial layers have been removed, so we can see what is deep. All right. So we can see um, deep to the trapezius and latissimus dorsi is the levator scapulae, rhomboidius minor, rhomboidius major. This is the spine of the scapula, and so this is supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and we can just barely see a little bit of the teres minor. And right, if we flip around to the front, um, we can see some of these muscles as well. Um, we can see a little bit of the trapezius, the deltoid, pectoralis major, pectoralis minor. Right, way over here, as well as here under your arms, this is the serratus anterior. And that's all that you guys are going to need to know um, for 
um, on this model for the next practical, so practical exam number three. Um, now we're going to be moving on to uh, talking about other arm muscles, right? So these ones are going to be responsible for controlling the elbow, the wrist, the fingers. Um, you can see a lot of those um, shoulder muscles a lot more clearly here. Um, note that this is the anterior side of the scapula, so that's what's right up against your rib cage. Um, that is the subscapularis, right? On the back of the scapula, so on the back of your shoulder, we can see the supraspinatus, infraspinatus. Here, and oh, I'm doing a bad job drawing this, but here is the division. Um, this is the teres minor. <laughs> Sorry about that. And this is the teres major. Um, on the posterior side of the humerus, we see that this and this, and actually there's a third head way over here, um, that is the triceps brachii. Okay, so we come to um, the rest of the muscles that move the forearm, the hand, and the fingers. Um, once again, there's instructions down here at the bottom left on how to get to um, some relevant videos on mastering AMP. Okay. Um, the first group of muscles I want to point out um, are muscles that we've already seen. These are the triceps brachii. Right? Remember that there are three different heads, and so it almost looks like three different muscles, but in fact, they are the same muscle. All right, so those are the elbow extensors. They extend the arm at the elbow, so hammering or um, you know, throwing a baseball. Um, the elbow flexors, there are three of them. They all work together, so they're all synergists. Um, the prime mover is the biceps brachii. Okay, just like with triceps, note there's no T. P.S. Biceps brachii. All right, it's not bicep, it's not bicep, it's biceps brachii. Okay, and we can see here that the biceps brachii um, has two heads. Right, one is on the coracoid process, one is on the humerus. So, um, yeah, so there. And it inserts way down here okay, on the radius. Okay, so on the thumb side muscle. Okay, um, the brachialis is deep to the biceps brachii, and so it's this little almond shape is actually right underneath the biceps brachii. And we'll take a look at this in another perspective here in just a second, but for now, um, the origin on the humerus, the insertion on the ulna. And so between the biceps brachii and the brachialis, we get um, elbow flexion, right? So lifting a dumbbell um, of both the radius and the ulna. All right, finally, we have the brachioradialis. And again, this is a muscle that sounds super scary because it's so long. Um, but just like we saw with the coracobrachialis, it's a compound word. And so the brachio part is the origin, the radialis part is the insertion. And so the origin is way up here on the brachial region on the humerus. And we can follow this muscle all the way down to ultimately insert on the distal end of the radius. Right, so this is actually um, the muscle that makes up um, that lateral curve on your arm. Right, so following your elbow down to your thumb, um, you have that, um, you know, you, you can feel the muscle that is your brachioradialis. And so let's look at these elbow flexors in another perspective. Um, what we can see here all the way to the left is um, a right arm. All right, we can see that on the thumb side of the arm, the brachioradialis is highlighted. Okay. Um, if we look at the back of that same right arm, we can see that the origin is a little bit posterior and that the brachioradialis is running with another muscle. And we'll talk about that other muscle here in a moment. All right, but because this muscle is crossing over the elbow, it is, well, crossing over the elbow on the front side of the elbow, what this means is that this is an elbow flexor, right? So flexing, so pulling the arm, forearm closer to the humerus. So flexing, okay? Um, 
What we can also see here is that when you lift your drink to your mouth, you are flexing the arm at the elbow. That is, um, that is a motion completed by the biceps brachii, so the prime mover of elbow flexion, but there are some synergists as well. So if we remove the biceps brachii, which has happened over here, biceps brachii cut, um, we can see that brachialis, which I tried to show you on the last slide. Here's the origin. Here is the insertion. Okay, and so insertion, pull towards origin, again, flexing at the elbow, allowing you to drink. Right? And the other synergist here is the brachioradialis. Insertion all the way down here on the radius, but on the distal end. Okay, so those are elbow flexors. They flex the elbow as opposed to um, the triceps brachii, which would be on the back. Right. the back of your upper arm that is going to extend so that is putting the glass down that's triceps biceps is going to let you drink all right and finally we get all the way down to the forearm muscles um, there are lots of forearm muscles we are certainly not going to cover all of them um, we're only going to cover a few and um, hopefully um, it won't seem so bad because there are a couple tricks. Um, first of all, um, we're going to start on the front of the forearm. Um, all of the muscles on the front of the forearm are the ones that allow you to flex your wrist. All right, so as we can see on this little diagram over here, um, you know, these arrows always indicate the movement Right, so we start out with a straight hand and then um, pull your hand forward, so flexing it, decreasing the angle of uh, the joint, in this case of the wrist. Right, So we start out with 180 degrees and then it is reduced. Okay. Um, all right, so all of the front forearm muscles are flexors. They flex the wrists, but also they all share approximately an origin point and that origin happens to be the medial epicondyle right so this is part of the humerus um, if you feel um, if you feel your elbow right there's the pointy part um, the olecranon process which is what you rest on when you rest your elbows on the table but um, if you feel to the medial side um, there's another bone there and so that little extension of bone is the medial epicondyle and so that is where all of these muscles are going to originate and their insertion is then going to uh, determine um, the specific movements from there. Yeah, so let's um, focus on the wrist flexors on the next slide. Okay, so what I have for you here is a right forearm. All right, I want to point out that um, this muscle right here, we talked about um, it crosses over the elbow, um, significantly crosses over the elbow, and that is the brachioradialis. And if we remove all of um, the muscles, this um, image to the left is what we see. So note, this is the medial epicondyle. That's what you can feel through your skin. Okay. Um, all right, so origin of these muscles is medial epicondyle. Um, the first muscle I want to talk about is the flexor carpi radialis. Now, all of these muscles are flexors, right? So the flexor tells us what exactly it does. Um, carpi, right? what is that talking about? Well, it's talking about the fact that this muscle inserts on the carpal bones. So these are the carpal bones, the wrist bones. And so this flexor carpi radialis muscle is going to originate where all the flexor muscles do, and it's going to insert on the carpals. Right, but where on the carpals? Well, it's going to run pretty much parallel and really close to the radius. All right, so the radius right, is always on the thumb side. All right, so this flexor carpi radialis muscle is going to flex the carpi flex, the wrist, from the radial side, from the lateral side. And so we can compare this to flexor carpi ulnaris. Right, so flexor carpi ulnaris, um, again, is a flexor, so it's on the front of the forearm. Carpi 
It's going to flex the wrist. And where is it going to flex the wrist from? Well, it's going to flex the wrist from the ulnar side, so from the pinky side of the wrist. Okay, so even though these names are really long and intimidating, we can break them down pretty easily. All right, now, there happen to be three of these flexor muscles right in a row. Um, the next one is palmaris longus. And so, no, unfortunately, it doesn't call itself a flexor, but we do know that it's a flexor muscle because it's on the front. Um, but the name also is going to help us. Um, palmaris, right? Note that this muscle doesn't stop at the carpi, right? it doesn't stop at the wrist, but instead it's going to stop or insert on the palm. Right, so it's the palm, palmaris, it goes all the way to the palm, and it's longer than the others because it's traveling farther. Right, so palmaris longus. Right, so um, my suggestion to you is to, when trying to identify these, find the medial epicondyle. Note that there are one, two, and three muscles coming off it. Right, so tendon one, tendon two, tendon three. And um, let's see, the muscle on the radius side is flexor carpi radialis, one in the middle that goes all the way. Oops, got to fix that. Um, I will fix that for you on your notes. Um, but the next muscle is palmaris longus, and the third muscle is the flexor carpi ulnaris. Sorry about that. Again, in your notes, this will be fixed. Um, the next muscle is the flexor digitorum superficialis. Now this muscle is deep to the three that we've just talked about, um, and it does something a little bit different. Um, specifically, what does it flex? It flexes not the wrist, but it flexes the digits. And so um, this muscle actually extends all the way down to the fingers, right? And it happens to be the most superficial of all the digitorum muscles, but ironically enough for us, it is the deepest of all the flexor muscles that we're looking at. And the final structure is not a muscle, but it is very important in um, keeping all of these different tendons and blood vessels and nerves actually in place. Right? So you have tons of things going all the way to the palm and the fingers, and so it's really important to make sure that those, um, those structures don't get all uh, tangled up. And so this connective tissue band, so kind of like wearing a watch or a bracelet, um, this is going to um, hold everything in place. Specifically, it holds everything in what is called the carpal tunnel, which is what's on the next slide. So we've surely heard of the carpal tunnel before um, in regards to carpal tunnel syndrome. All right, so first let's talk about carpal tunnel. Um, if we take a transverse section of the wrist, we can see that the carpal bones actually form this little cup. Right? In that cup, we have nerves, we have tendons, we have blood vessels, right? We have all sorts of different things that are passing to the hand. And of course, the hand is very active, takes a lot of innervation and a lot of uh, blood, right, to feed it. And so um, all of these things, as I just said, are kept in place by the flexor retinaculum. So that's over here. And so we have this big circle of all sorts of stuff, right? Um, and of course, we can see that up here as well, right? This connective tissue band, the flexor retinaculum, which is holding all that stuff in place. Now, carpal tunnel syndrome is when we sit here on our computers all the time and we rest our hands on our wrist. What that's going to do is it is going to compress the carpal tunnel. So all of those nerves, blood vessels, tendons, they are going to be compressed in that space. And so obviously that's not very good for them. Um, and so uh, this leads to um, a lack of ability to control your hands. It hurts a lot um, because your tissues are constantly damaged. You're constantly trying to heal them. Um, there's inflammation, which further compresses all of these structures. Um, and so um, overuse of you know, your hands, of your uh, you know, extra pressure on your wrists can of course lead to this, but also um, there are other risk factors such as, um, you know, Choose your parents wisely, right? Uh, you might just be, excuse me, be genetically prone to having um, 
you know, narrow, narrow carpal tunnels and therefore getting carpal tunnel syndrome more easily, um, but also things like obesity. Um, and, you know, if you're a factory worker, like using your hands over and over and over again. Um, and other things like pregnancy and the lack of uh, blood flow due to diabetes um, can also um, increase, increase your risk of developing carpal tunnel syndrome. Okay. Um, so at this point, we have talked about um, the muscles that flex and extend at the elbow. Right, so lift the glass up, put the glass down. That is elbow flexion and extension. Um, we've talked about wrist flexors. Right, so pull your hand forward or back. Or sorry, we've just talked about wrist flexors. Um, now let's talk about pronators and supinators. Now these are technically acting on the elbow, but we see the movement in our hands, which is why I'm um, bringing this up right now. Um, what these muscles are doing is they are rotating that radius bone around the capitulum of the humerus bone. Okay, um, And so the pronator terrace is responsible for pronation. Right, so flipping your hand over to get a stamp, right? But supination is bringing your thumb back to the lateral side of your hand, um, therefore holding your hand out for soup. Okay, now we get to the extensor muscles of the wrist. Um, as I said before, all of the uh, muscles on the back of your forearm are responsible for extension at the wrist. Um, so these are posterior. Um, they uh, all originate approximately around the lateral epicondyle, right? And so we can find the lateral epicondyle and follow the muscles down from there. Um, again, these are all responsible for extension, so pulling your hand back. Okay. Um, we already know a couple of these muscles. Uh, we know the triceps brachii for throwing a ball. We know the brachioradialis for lifting your arm up to take a drink. And even though we're looking at the back of the arm, keep in mind that um, your arm is three-dimensional. And so um, we can actually see a little bit of the front muscles on the back, including flexor carpi ulnaris. And so the pinky side, as always, is um, the ulnar side. So this is flexor carpi ulnaris. Okay, um, right, so all of these guys uh, originate on the lateral epicondyle. Flexor carpi radialis longus, right? So on the thumb side, right, we have the flexor carpi radialis muscles, or so, oh my goodness, sorry, um, extensor carpi radialis muscles. So these are responsible for extension, they're on the back. What are they extending? They're extending the wrist. What side of the wrist? On the radial side of the wrist. Okay. Um, there are actually two of these muscles, which is why we have extensor carpi radialis longus. Okay, and the other one is brevis or brevis. And so this one really is brief or short, um, at least from what we can see in this image and on the model. Um, very tiny wedged in between radialis longus. And our next muscle, extensor digitorum. And so this should sound really familiar to a muscle that we already know. Our legs, our calves, have an extensor digitorum longus. And in the calf, this muscle was responsible for extending the digits, right? Oru meaning of multiple digits, okay? Our calves are longer than our forearms, and so the extender of the digits of our fingers um, is just that extensor digitorum, as opposed to of our toes, which is extensor digitorum longus. Okay, so this muscle is here, and we know it goes all the way to the digits because we can actually see the tendons going to the fingers, not stopping at the wrist. All right, and finally, in this group, we have extensor carpi ulnaris. All right, so here. Again, we can kind of use um, our imagination to a certain extent, but this muscle here is on the back of the wrist that's an extensor. What does it extend the wrist? On what side of the wrist? On the ulnar side of the wrist. Okay, and so just like we saw on the front, we have um, extensor carpi radialis, another muscle in between extensor digitorum and extensor carpi ulnaris. 
Okay, so this group of several muscles, the two extensors on the outsides, and then another muscle on the inside. Okay, also, um, the ulnar muscles, for example, extensor carpi ulnaris and flexor carpi ulnaris happen to be right next to each other. So when you put your forearms on the table, right, you are actually um, leaning on the flexor and extensor carpi ulnaris muscles. Okay, um, there is also an extensor retinaculum, just like there's a flexor retinaculum. Um, again, to hold all of the nerves and blood vessels and tendons in place. Okay, there's just um, two more motions I want to talk about at the wrist. We already know all the muscles that we need to know, um, but we haven't really talked about adduction and abduction at the wrist. Okay, um, so bringing the pinky closer to the body and bringing the thumb away from the body are adduction and abduction. Okay, so in order to produce these movements, we are pretty much tugging on the wrist from either side, right? Going towards the pinky or going towards the thumb. Right? So this is kind of like um, jazz hands going on, right? So like side to side of your hand. Okay, so if we wanted to pull our hand towards the pinky side, so adduction, we would use muscles that are attached to the wrist on the pinky side. Right, so this um, bone on the pinky side is the ulna. Right, so um, we should use ulnar or medial bones. Okay, so we would or muscles, sorry. Um, so we'll use our two ulnaris muscles, flexor and extensor carpi. Ulnaris. Okay, if we wanted to pull our hand towards our thumb side, we would pull the wrist from the thumb side. Right? Remember that um, the thumb side bone is the radius, right? so we'd want to use our radial muscles. Okay, so any radial muscle, uh, flexor carpi radialis, extensor carpi radialis, longus, and brevis. Which brings us to the nerves. The arm is controlled by the brachial plexus. Right, so here we can see that um, spinal nerves C5 down through T1 are going to contribute to the innervation or the actual control of the muscles that we just talked about in the arm. Okay. Um, as with any plexus, these nerves come together, split apart, come together, split apart. And this is advantageous um, because if there is an injury to you know, one of these nerves here, um, there's still a lot of other nerves that can kind of pick up the slack. Okay? So um, we have spinal nerves, which join together into trunks. Okay, so it's a three trunks. But then there's trunks split apart again. And so they split into anterior and posterior halves of those three trunks. Now those divisions then come together to form three chords and right? they're kind of mixing up as they go along and finally we end up with the named nerves and we can talk about um, the actual role and the innervation of each one of these nerves. Okay, um, let's see. So uh, this chart here shows you exactly what uh, ultimately spinal nerves come together right, through middle trunk, division, cord, blah, 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 all the way until the median nerve, for example. Right, so we can um, figure that out. Um, the top left color codes, the trunks, cords, and divisions, um, and the muscle, or sorry, the nerves that I want to point out now um, are on the right side. Okay, and so um, just like with the leg nerves, we can see that the nerves are named according to where they are. Um, this first one here in green um, actually passes through your armpit and comes out the other side. Now, um, this is in your shoulder, so the lateral side of your shoulder. We can see it on the lateral side of your greater tubercle right here. Um, and so uh, just as 
is the case with the leg, um, you should be thinking about what muscles are in this area. All right, so this nice curve of your shoulder right here is one big triangular shaped muscle, and this nerve is going right to it. All right, so this nerve controls or innervates the deltoid muscle right, because that's where the deltoid muscle is. Okay, uh, now what is the name of this? The name of this nerve is the auxiliary or axillary nerve. All right, and this should make sense because the armpit region, right, which is where this thing is actually passing through, is called the axillary or auxiliary region. Okay. Um, next, let's look at the musculocutaneous. All right, so here, um, this muscle is going to be, or sorry, this nerve is going to be responsible for controlling the muscles and the cutaneous, the skin of the lateral side of the arm over here. All right, perhaps even easier nerves to note. Um, this green nerve here is the radial nerve, and look at that, it's running with the radius. Right? The ulnar nerve is running with the ulna, right? on the, uh, the pinky side. And in between them, right, between the radius and the ulna, you have a median nerve. In fact, it is median in between the radius and the ulna. Okay, so all of these nerves um, kind of make sense. I think the only one that is um, any bit tricky is the musculocutaneous nerve. All right, so it's the axillary if it goes through the armpit, it's the radial if it's with the radius, ulnar if it's with the ulna, median if it's between them. And if it's none of those, it's the musculocutaneous. All right, just one more um, thing to point out before we move on to the next slide here is that um, remember that all of the flexor muscles, right, the wrist flexor muscles are going to originate here on the medial epicondyle. Right, and they are going to travel in this direction to the wrist. So too does the ulnar nerve. Right, so you can see the ulnar nerve is actually with those flexor muscles. And so the ulnar nerve innervates the flexing of the wrist or the flexor muscles. And if you look over here to the radial nerve, right, this passes over See if I can still see it here on um, the lateral epicondyle and we can even see that it's passing around behind the forearm okay so the radial nerve is going to innervate wrist extension the ulnar nerve innervates the wrist flexors okay just another way of showing this um, again a diagram that doesn't have my drawings all over it and I do want to point out that your medial epicondyle sticks out pretty far in your skin, right? I told you earlier that you can feel this through your skin. And so when you bash your elbow into something, it hurts like heck, right? Thus, it's the funny bone. I hit my funny bone. Well, yes, you hit your humerus. Um, but the reason it hurts so dang much is that the ulnar nerve is actually on the outside of this bone. And so you're not only hitting the bone, you are smashing your ulnar nerve, right? So sometimes you can get some like tingles all the way up to your fingertips. That's because that nerve is sending and receiving messages all the way to and from your fingertips. Okay. Um, the other thing is um, all right, the median nerve and the radial nerve, right? They are shockingly close to your radius and your ulna. Um, and so if you um, break your arm or dislocate your elbow, um, you run a, a pretty good chance of damaging these nerves. Okay. Um, I am not going to walk you through all of these. Um, what each one of these different um, like mini slides is showing you is what the nerves are going to innervate, right? It shows you the skin that is innervated and it's going to show you um, the muscles, right? And so um, as, I, um, as I mentioned before, um, just think about where the nerves are, right? So the axillary nerve, right, is going to innervate the deltoid because it's right there in your shoulder. 
right? The ulnar is going to innervate um, muscles uh, that are on the front, right? The radial nerve is going to innervate muscles that are on the back of your forearm, um, and the median nerve is going to innervate um, more lateral slash anterior muscles, right? So the palmaris longus is right in the middle of that group of flexor muscles, and so it is innervated by the middle nerve. Okay, um, so uh, my suggestion would be to have these uh, little placards available um, when you are studying, when you are taking an assessment. Um, one more note about um, the placement of these nerves. Um, or a couple slides worth of uh, notes about this. Um, when you dislocate your shoulder, right, it's very common for an anterior dislocation. That is, for your head of your humerus to be pushed anteriorly right, and actually come out of its nice little glenoid cavity of the scapula. Right, this is uh, such a big deal because your axillary nerve <laughs> is going through your armpit. And so your humerus can actually stretch or sever this axillary nerve um, by moving out of its um, normal compartment, normal cavity here. Okay, so um, the symptoms of actually um, overstretching or an avulsion, so actually tearing away from the rest of the, um, the tissue um, is soreness, right? It's gonna take a lot um, to heal. Um, you can't move, right? Specifically, you cannot um, work your deltoids. So you can't add abduct to the side. You cannot flex to the front. You can't extend to the back, right? All of those movements are with the deltoid. And if you can't control your deltoid because the axillary nerve is messed up, you're not going to have any of those movements, right? So your arm's pretty much dead. Um, in order to allow for this healing to occur. Um, of course, even if um, your nerve is damaged or torn, um, you can regenerate your nerves. Right? It is very possible. We have a lot of uh, plasticity, which we'll get into later this term. It just takes a long time. Right? So one millimeter a day is painfully slow, right? but you're not going to be doing much with that arm until the nerves are regenerated. A couple more um, kind of symptoms of uh, damaging the nerves of your arm. Right? So if there's any kind of damage um, also to the surgical neck, right? so this right here, surgical neck of your humerus, this can also damage your axillary nerve. Um, also, if you are um, getting a shoulder or having any kind of surgery, shoulder surgery, um, your doctor has to be very careful of that nerve. They have to make sure they're only working on either side of that nerve so as not to cause even more damage. Um, if you break your arm in the middle of your diaphysis, right, that can often result in what is called um, uh, wrist drop. Right? And so what's going on here? Well, if you fracture your bone um, in the middle of diaphysis, um, what happens is that can damage your radial nerve, right? Remember um, that your radial nerve is responsible for um, extension of the wrist. And so pretty much you can't pull your hand back. You can't pull it up, um, say hi, right? It just kind of flops forward towards your palm. And so it's called a wrist dropped and, and indicates radial nerve damage. Um, all right, and finally, um, the medial epicondyle, right? That piece of bone that you can feel sticking out, your funny bone. Um, if you break that, right, remember that your ulnar nerve is just so close to that uh, particular structure. And so this can lead to damage um, if uh, this is broken.